400 million years ago, the world was very different from how it is today. Not much was happening life-wise on our planet. In fact, all known life was to be found lurking, uh, lurking around uh, in the murky depths of our ocean. But it was around about that time that uh, the first green shoots of plant life were starting to emerge uh, on the surface of the planet, on the dry surface of the planet. This attracted the attention of a small arthropod. It was about the size of a crayfish, and it resembled a centipede. It made its way to the edge of the water uh, and stuck a tentative claw out of the water to touch dry land for the first time. I say it was a claw, but uh, it could have been a flipper. Maybe it was a stalk, we're not sure. Uh, maybe it was a hand. But one way or the other, the arthropod decided it didn't like what it felt. It retracted its arm and retreated back into the water. It sat there contemplating its next move. It took about a million years or so until it eventually launched itself out of the water in a giant act of bravery that was unprecedented and unheralded before or since and it made its way onto land for the first time. History doesn't record um, at what point the arthropod realized it couldn't breathe now that it was out of the water, uh, and natural selection obviously took its course, uh, but one way or the other, it learned to adapt on dry land and learned to breathe. It went about its business, and some of the arthropods lost their front legs and developed wings, and they became known as birds. Others learned to walk upright, they developed language, uh, they found a way to communicate with each other, they invented fire, they invented the wheel. They became known as humans, you and me. Evolution became a hot, trending topic. Everyone was doing it. It was the cool thing to do. And that little arthropod was one of the earliest influences on our planet. You see, evolution happens because, as creatures on this planet, um, we find it necessary for our survival. It's hardwired into us that to succeed on the planet, we have to constantly improve. We have to constantly find more efficient ways of doing what we do in order to survive. So as the arthropods went about their business, well, they were now human beings, they developed a moral code. The moral code was along the lines of don't kill each other, uh, be nice to each other, occasionally hug each other. And slowly they learned that it was important for human relationships to start forming beyond just this raw impulse to perpetuate our DNA. They learned to fall in love, they made friends, they created families and communities and villages and cities. And over time they learned a skill which stays with us to this day, and it's one of those skills that separates us from every other living being on the planet. And it is the skill of empathy. Then along came technology. And I'm not sure that technology has done much in terms of our physical selves. Uh, we haven't yet grown an extra arm to carry our smartphone or developed a second face for that inevitable quick selfie. Um, but it has undoubtedly had an impact and effect on the way that we are. It's had an effect uh, on the way that our brains work and that, uh, the way that our hearts work. Evolution does happen in a straight line, but it doesn't always move forwards. Sometimes you take two steps forward and one step back. Those are glitches. They're momentary lapses of reason, if you like. They're just little things that need some correction, some tweaking, and then we can carry on forward. Occasionally, you have giant leaps backwards. Uh, scientists, in their very optimistic way, call these extinction events. They're things from which we'll never recover. Those have happened five times in the history of our planet, the most recent about 60 million years ago. What's happening to us now, though, is that for all of our smugness and our cleverness as a species, we're starting to chip away as a result of technology at that one thing that we learned millions of years ago, the one thing that separated us from other creatures on the planet. We've started to erode at our sense of empathy. Now, you might be wondering why the CEO of South Africa's National Arts Festival is standing here talking to you about evolution and creatures um, and empathy. There's a saying uh, from Abraham Maslow, the guy who did the hierarchy of needs, uh, it's his law of the instrument, which says, if you're holding a hammer, everything around you looks like a nail. And in this world, we have a lot of nails. We have lots of things that need fixing. And in that context, the hammer that I hold is the hammer of the arts. So when I see something that needs fixing, my inevitable solution is going to be the arts. So we'll get to the solution in a moment. But first, let's understand what empathy is. Empathy is the act of considering what someone else is feeling, and feeling is ourselves. As I said earlier, it's learned behavior. Scientists believe we start learning it from the age of two. And the process of learning it goes something like this. I have a friend called Sally. She has a ball. Sally has lost her ball. She's now sad. I know what sad feels like. I feel sorry for Sally. I'm going to give Sally a hug. That's a two-year-old learning empathy. And they learn it because they've modeled that behavior on watching their parents do it. Because as evolutionary human beings, we know that we need to empathize with each other in order to survive on the planet. But what happens when their parents are not modeling that behavior? When their parents' first reaction to Sally's lost ball is to whip out a smartphone, 
take a picture of the ball of Sally, post it on Facebook so that they can berate Sally's parents because they are not good enough parents. They allowed their daughter to lose the ball. Oh, and by the way, click, here's my daughter. She's still got her ball. Isn't she amazing and what a great parent I am. I'm virtue signaling myself. And isn't it great that I can slam someone else at the same time? So in that context, the children modeling their parents' behavior are doing that. They're no longer empathizing. They're battling with it a little bit. How did we get here? I think social media has created a selfish, narcissistic vortex into which we're all being sucked. It sounds like quite a dramatic statement, but I do work in the arts. Um, it, I think we're all being sucked into this vortex. And let me illustrate it. In 2015, Microsoft published a study which said that the human being's attention span had reduced, on average, to eight seconds. The significance of that number is that the average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. So for the first time ever, the attention span of the human being has dropped to below that of a goldfish. Wow. Now, goldfish is notoriously difficult to read. I think the study is a little bit problematic. How do you know when a goldfish is losing interest in the conversation? Is it when they turn around and swim away, or they keep looking at you? And I think that uh, levels of attention are all relative to where we started. A physicist can spend an entire evening reading a physics textbook, but not, might not get more than five pages through a comic. So it is all relative. But let's put that aside. One way or another, the fact is our attention spans have shortened. We know this instinctively. We know that we spend less time engaging now than we did in the past. Whether it's eight seconds or 20 seconds doesn't really matter. But let's stick with eight, because Microsoft said it, so it must be true. Um, we allow ourselves eight seconds as we're scrolling through our Facebook feed. In that time, we come across a piece of information. We see it. We read it. We analyze where it came from. We decide pretty quickly if we agree with it or not. We respond to it online by clicking an emoticon, happy face, sad face, whatever the other ones are. We click like, or we click share, so that we can show everyone else how clever we are because we're sharing something really cool, or we type a comment. We do all of that in eight seconds. We then go on to the next piece of information, and so on and so on and so on. So we don't give ourselves the time to sit and properly engage. There was a time where debate was about sitting and listening to someone, hearing what it is that they have to say, slowly unpicking their argument, asking them questions, interrogating it, responding to it, perhaps by reformulating your own position, making your own position stronger and richer, and putting the planks in place to slowly create a better argument than you had when you started. That's not what debate looks like in 2018. Debate now is finding someone on Twitter who says something that you wish you'd said in a way that you wish you'd said it, and an increased desire to make yourself look really clever, so you retweet it in eight seconds. That's what debating has become. We have allowed outrage to become the new currency online. The more we have, the more important we are. The more outrage we can exhibit, the less people will look at our own flaws. And that has become the new currency. That's why I say that we've become narcissistic human beings. So that's where we're at, and what is the impact of that? Early on, I mentioned Abraham Maslow. You, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the triangle, the hierarchy of needs. The second last layer in that hierarchy is the esteem layer. We are wheel spinning in the esteem layer, and we will never, ever get out. Because we're constantly trying to build up our self-esteem. And social media, ironically named social media, which has made us the most unsocial species on the planet, social media is forcing us to wheel spin in that esteem space. We will never win that battle, because there will always be someone who's got more friends than we do on Facebook, who gets more likes on their posts, who's got more followers on Twitter, whatever the case might be. But the fact is that we are stopping ourselves from reaching that final layer, the self-actualization layer. So how do we make that leap? How do we leap out of the water of the esteem, see what I did there, and get onto the drier shore of self-actualization? I said that I'm holding a hammer, which is the arts, so I believe that the arts is the way that we can start reclaiming our empathy. When I talk about arts education, people glaze over a little bit, and they say, why should I educate myself or allow my children to become educated, to become artists? Artists don't make money. They put themselves out there, they make themselves vulnerable. People criticize them all the time. There's no career in the arts. And the favorite when I was growing up, and I'm sure you had it too, was, oh, you want to be an artist. You probably should study something to fall back on. Go and, go and study teaching, just so you've got something to fall back on. In other words, when you would discover that you're a crap artist. But the fact is, those people are missing the point. Arts education is not about educating children to become artists. Arts education is about educating people to become better humans. Because through the arts, we can rediscover our empathy. 
to illustrate that. The most common form of arts is theatre, and if you are cast in a play and you're playing the role of a character, to successfully play that role, you have to understand everything about that character. You have to know why they say absolutely everything that they say. You know why, you have to figure out why they move from one end of the stage to the other. You have to figure out where they were before the play started and where they're going to be after the play ends. You have to completely immerse yourself in that character. Are those not the skills that we want judges, psychologists, forensic pathologists, detectives, lawyers, psychologists? Don't we want them to have those same skills? <laughs> if a psychologist could figure out Hamlet, they can certainly figure me out. Looking at the field of music, we know that the manual dexterity required to master an instrument is hugely important. You have to build muscle memory in through hours and hours and hours of practice. You also have to go through boring, repetitive tasks over and over and over again to master an instrument or a piece of music. That's exactly the same skill that we need a surgeon to have before they cut you open, or your dentist to have before they advance upon your mouth with a drill. Those are the same skills. When a conductor walks into a room of solo musicians, that room becomes a group known as an orchestra. The conductor presents them with their vision, which is a score, it's a piece of music. If the conductor is a good one, they will explain the score and they will explain their vision to the people sitting in front of them. And everyone in that room will know that they've got a part to play in realizing that vision. Sometimes they have to play, they have to play really loudly. They might get a solo. There might be times where they have to hold back and be quiet. There might be times where you all have to play in unison. Isn't that exactly what the CEO of a major company has to do? Sell a vision, pull a team together, manage that team so that sometimes some of them are holding back, some of them are shining, realizing that they're all part of a bigger goal. And finally, when it comes to literature, to successfully get into a book, Dr. Keith Oakley says that book reading is actually mind reading. Because as you immerse yourself in a book, a novel, a piece of fiction, you have to fully immerse yourself in order to understand what the characters are doing. You have to allow yourself to be swept away by the imagination of someone else as they have constructed this world for you. In so doing, you're learning the deepest form of empathy possible. Is that not a skill that we want all of our children to have? Is that not a great gift that we can give our children? More importantly, is that not a great gift that we are passing on to every single person that our child is going to encounter for the rest of their lives? Technology is wonderful. I love it, I use it. I don't want to be hypocritical here. It is life-changing. We've heard today many stories of how people are using technology in fantastic ways. But as we swim through this sea of technology, we have to remember that there's nowhere else we can touch. There's no other land. This is it, we're stuck here. And if in the course of swimming through that sea, we forget why we're there in the first place, if we forget that empathy, if we forget how to harness and use that empathy, it's going to drift away into the murky depths of the ocean and will never be reclaimed. Thank you.